Welcome to Spiritual Naturalism Today, a conversation on science, nature, and spirituality. Our program is sponsored by the Spiritual Naturalist Society with host Daniel Strain. Hello, and thanks for listening. I'm Daniel Strain, and I'm joined by my co-host, Lee Anderson. Hello, Lee. Good morning. Today, our special guest is Stephen Bachelor. Stephen is a Buddhist teacher and writer, known for his secular or agnostic approach to Buddhism as a constantly evolving culture of awakening rather than a religious system based on immutable dogmas and beliefs. Through his writings, translations, and teachings, Stephen engages in a critical exploration of Buddhism's role in the modern world, which has earned, earned him both condemnation as a heretic and praise as a reformer. Born in Scotland in 1953, Stephen was ordained as a novice Buddhist monk in the Tibetan Gelug tradition in 1974. In 1981, he went to South Korea to train in the Son Zen Buddhism in the... The Chogye Order. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, he disrobed in 1985 and returned to Europe. From 1990, he has been a teacher at Gaia House Meditation Center in Devon, England, and since 1992, a contributing editor of Tricycle Buddhist Review. Stephen is also on the advisory board of our own Spiritual Naturalist Society. He is the translator and author of several books and articles on Buddhism, including the best-selling Buddhism Without Beliefs and Confession of a Buddhist Atheist. His most recent book is After Buddhism, Rethinking the Dharma for a Secular Age. He lives in southwest France with his wife, Martine. Stephen, thank you so much for being on our program and for your time today. It's a pleasure to be here, Daniel and Lee. Um, I don't know if uh, you know this, but we recently had on Ted Meisner, who's the, uh, mm -hmm. the head of the Secular Buddhist Association. And we also had a good opportunity to talk with him about secular Buddhism. Um, you were one of the very first people when uh, I was putting together plans for the Spiritual Naturalist Society that I knew was going to be a, a wonderful guideline for us, your thoughts and your approach to Buddhism. And I just wanted to thank you for, for your work and... Um, it's meant a lot to me, and uh, I'm sure a lot of our our uh, members and subscribers. Thank you. Good. No, I'm glad I can be of some help. <laughs> well, uh, so I guess maybe we could kind of take this chronologically. Uh, I, I think a lot of people would be very interested to hear about your time as a monk and um, how you first came to that and what your experience was like. Okay, well, um, very difficult to reconstruct all of these things from now, 40 years later. <laughs> I was drawn to Buddhism very much in the same way as many people were in the 1960s. There was a general fascination with Eastern religion, Eastern philosophy, and simultaneously a somewhat uh, negative uh, sense of our own Western culture. And like a lot of others, I went overland to India in the early 1970s. I ended up in Dharamsala, which is where the Dalai Lama lived then. He still lives there now. And became quickly very involved in the study of Buddhism. And in order to devote myself to this uh, study and, and training, I realized that if I were a monk, that would really focus my attention. I wouldn't really have much else to think about. <laughs> And um, so I uh, took uh, robes, 1974, and uh, for the next 10 years, I um, lived as a monk. And now, before you decided to do that, uh, what had your beliefs been just before that, just before coming well, in? Well, I was, I was raised uh, in a family that was broadly humanist in outlook. In fact, my grandfather... Um, had rejected Christianity back ooh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And my mother, um, who raised me and my brother, 
was uh, very much of his opinion. So we were excluded from any church-going activities. I wasn't raised as a Christian. I never went to church. I was never confirmed in the Anglican church. And um, oddly, I think I missed something. And I wonder if that might not have been one of the reasons I was attracted to the most religious of all the Buddhist schools, the Tibetan form, which is quite uh, hmm. Catholic in many of its uh, forms and its beliefs and so on. So I plunged into that headlong. And I, 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 and, uh, I, find that very, I found that very ful fulfilling. Um, it was something very foreign, obviously. I'm sure there was a, quite a strong element of romanticism and idealism as well. But nonetheless, it sort of it did touch on areas in my life that I've never really explored before. That's fascinating. Yeah, I, I come from a, a Christian background before mm -hmm. I got into all this. And I, but I came through humanism prior to this as well. So I went from Christianity to humanism and the, the thing that I found really fascinating was that my experience with religion, uh, because it was Protestant Christianity, was that religion was about belief. You had to believe the right checklist of this. This was what you were supposed to believe. If you believe that, then everything was great. And if you don't, well, then that's the problem. There wasn't much about practice. In fact, the whole idea of your religion being a practice was a foreign to me. So when I came across, uh, and so from, from that I left into humanism, which very much is, is kind of in a similar boat uh, for a lot of people. It's a checklist. If you look at the humanist manifesto, there's these set things, and we believe this. Okay, so I'm a humanist now because I believe the checklist. So the same sort of mindset. So then when I came across Eastern thought and, and uh, Buddhism and Taoism, I, I was... Uh, that was the main thing that struck me at first, was that this was a practical, applicable thing with a goal and a process for reaching that goal. Um, that was completely foreign to me. From and, and I know now, in retrospect, that there is a contemplative Christian tradition, but that was foreign to me growing up in Houston, Texas, or the area. Well, that's, um, I think, certainly part of the attraction of Buddhism. Um, I had, during my childhood, periodically uh, had a curiosity about Christianity, but uh, it had never engaged my interest uh, in any particular way. The, so I think with Buddhism, certainly the element that there was something you did, something that you could actually achieve through your own applications was very attractive. But I do also think that in my own case, it offered me some of the consolations of, of religion as well. In other words, it did have belief systems I mean, quite strict in, in, in many ways. Uh, in Tibetan and uh, other forms of Buddhism, you are expected to sign checklists, although that's not quite how they put it. <laughs> but um, that's what it boils down to. But coupled with that, and I think given more emphasis to that, is the, uh, is the suggestion that you actually put these things into practice in such a way that it you know, has a transformative effect on on who you are and how you live, and, uh, how you perceive the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was always very central. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned the uh, romantic components that drew you initially, the, uh, the ceremony and the, uh, that sort of thing. And a lot of people, I think, when they hear secular Buddhism, uh, imagine that it's you know, stripped of all of that, and it's just basically atheism plus meditation. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> um, well, there's some truth to that, you know. Um, the uh, it, 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 uh, Buddhism is atheistic, uh, but on the other hand, it's not atheistic in the sense that a lot of contemporary atheists would understand. It's not Buddhism is not premised uh, on the denial of God, and it doesn't make a lot of fuss about uh, there being no God. Uh, it's simply a tradition in which God simply doesn't play a role and never has. So it's, um, it's a much cleaner kind of atheism. It's not weighted with a, a lot of frustration and aversion that we often find in the West. Um, so uh, in that sense, yes, uh, meditation uh, uh, certainly is a key practice, but I think we have to be a little bit careful here. Um, there is a ritualistic element to 
uh, secular Buddhism. Um, and that would be, for example, each time we sit together in a room with 20 other people and we sit cross-legged on the floor and we ring a bell uh, and we just call this meditation. But remember, there's more to it than just doing a, a mental exercise in your head. You're doing so in a group. You're doing so in a particular setting. And if someone were to peer into the window from outside the door not knowing what was going on, they'd probably think you were involved in some kind of ri ritual activity. And so ritual, I think, is a word that we have to unpack. Uh, I think it's very difficult for human beings who, um, who, who, who work together in any field to completely eschew uh, any kind of uh, ritual behavior. In other words, things that we do together uh, in a particular form and style on a regular basis uh, as a way of affirming what, in fact, our, our core values are. Uh, is, I think, uh, probably a reasonable working definition of ritual. But when we do hear ritual today, we usually think it means burning incense and ringing uh, certain instruments and, uh, and bowing before altars and so on. But that's, again, just a, another variant on the same topic, really. Sure, and it depends on uh, what your understanding of those activities is and why you're doing them. Um, if you think that the, there's something inhabiting the statue is going to bless you because you bowed to it. That's totally different than, uh, than the approach. In fact, one of the, uh, one of my first experiences at Buddhist temple, uh, my wife and I go to the Jade Buddha temple here in Houston and we, uh, it's a temple that includes all of the different schools. So it's very, uh, um, diverse in that way, but that also tends to make them focus on the most core, uh, you know, types of things it makes it very good for us. But one of the first experiences I had there was uh, that taught that told me something about ritual and what role ritual could have for a secular person, for a naturalist. Mm -hmm. Is uh, I asked the monk, "Well, why do you bow?" Because you know, I was new to all this, and uh, and the monk told me he said, "Well, that's just a statue, just a piece of wood." We're do but the the point is, by doing this physical activity, when we come into this space it makes it more real to you. It helps you to direct your attention toward what you came in here for and put away all of the other stuff from your, your life outside. And that reminded me of an experiment where they, uh, they found that when people pass through a doorway, they have a harder time uh, remembering the second half of mental tasks than when they don't. And, then, and so they, huh. they did this study with two tables and two things two two sets of items on the tables and they had people bring things from one table to the next in a certain pattern and when they put a wall with a doorway in between all of a sudden their their performance w went way way down oh. and so i think there's a you know it's exactly what you would expect if in a naturalist universe that there would be this interplay between the mental and the physical because it's all one system um, so, to me, the, the physical aspects of whether it's stimulating my olfactory senses with incense or a certain lighting, or it's all about getting us into a mindset that's conducive to what we're trying to do. That, that's absolutely right. That's, uh, I guess, well, that makes per perfect uh, sense. Um, but still, I would, as a secular Buddhist, I would, I would draw the line of burning incense and uh, doing things which have an overtly uh, religious or one, one might say sort of superstitious quality really. Mm. I mean one can unpack the meaning of those rituals in a perfectly naturalistic way as your monk did. Um, but nonetheless um, I think they can easily be, they can easily slip into a kind of uh, uncritical devotional activity which is often a way of uh, of, of, of uh, in a sense, making yourself beholden to some authority other than yourself. But that goes hand in hand with a lot of these performances. Is that it's not just about opening yourself, it's also about setting yourself in a particular structure of power. Um, so I think it is important uh, as a secular Buddhist that we, uh, in a sense, pare them down to the barest necessity. Uh, and uh, as we might observe in a lot of uh, religious settings, the ri 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 rituals have a tendency to, to grow, to multiply, and to become more and more elaborate. And people so, tend uh, to focus on the uh, um, 
the unessential parts. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, oh, wait, that person doesn't bow correctly, so they're bad. They're right. they're bad. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I think, broadly speaking, it's a good thing to uh, sort of clear away uh, in order to get back to what these things are, are, are actually about. So atheism without athe atheism with meditation uh, is, I think, a reasonably good sort of thumbnail sketch of, of what a secular Buddhist approach might be. But again, it's I, we don't want to emphasize entirely meditation. That again makes it too personal and subjective. I think we can never uh, exclude that it's also essentially an ethical practice. That uh, we're concerned about finding values. Uh, and affirming those values and seeking to live those values out in the context of our relationships with others, with uh, other forms of life, with the world. Um, and to me, that's uh, if the meditation doesn't operate within an ethical frame, then it's somehow lost something vital. It's become just a technical exercise. And so we have lots of people today doing mindfulness uh, in therapy and business. But problem, I think, often is that it's reducing uh, what can be a very effective form of inner discipline and practice into a kind of self-help technique uh, that might be subservient to, you know, performing better for the company or dealing with some health issue. But uh, as, a, as, a, as a Buddhist practice, it, that would be considered to be a very narrow way of uh, understanding the role of meditation in one's life as a whole. The concept of uh, mindfulness just begs the question of what are we to be mindful <laughs> and why? Yeah. Yeah, what are we mindful of, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a wonderful point. Um, so what about the, uh, it seems to me, as, as I look at the schools of Buddhism and how they came into being over time, that I see something, um, this is again from, from my Christian background, I, I see something kind of inversed. You know, it seems to me that with Christianity, you've got at the core this uh, uh, resurrection of this Christ figure. Uh, so you've got at the core a supernatural sort of thing, and then built around that as a whole layer upon layer of traditions over a long period of time. And throughout that, you can find wisdom, pieces of wisdom, wisdom streams that came into being and built around that. But it when I look at Buddhism, what I see is what seems to be more of a, of a, a rational, uh, naturalistic core that over time had layers that built up and became more and more supernaturalized. Um, so actually going back in Buddhism or a conservative Buddhism becomes more secular, whereas a conservative Christianity becomes more and more religious. <laughs> that, that may well be true, actually. The, uh, it's certainly the case in my own journey through Buddhism, which started with perhaps its most overtly religious form, that of Tibetan Buddhism. I then trained as a Zen Buddhist monk, and again, that was still, you know, religious in a way, but a lot of the supernaturalism had been, uh, in a sense, was less visible. It may be there in the background. But more recently, the last 20 or so years, my interest has focused almost entirely upon trying to recover something of the historical uh, Gautama, the historical Buddha, and trying to sort of get a picture of what he was doing at his time in the 5th century BC that was um, so distinctive. And it's as you say, what, the further back you go to the earliest source materials, the more secular they become. In other words, the Buddha is quite explicitly rejecting the supernaturalism. Uh, even traditional ideas like rebirth and so on and karma, uh, he is pretty agnostic about them in, in, in many texts. Mm. Uh, so we do recover something closer, I would say, in the earliest strata of Buddhist tradition to uh, the Hellenistic philosophers like Stoicism or Epicureanism. Uh, it seems to be more like that, a practical philosophy of life that is rational on the one hand, that is um, empirical on another. In other words, don't really look or attend to anything outside of an experience that you yourself can, can validate and demonstrate. And uh, it is also very life-affirming. It's about trying to find a way of life uh, that deals with your, you know, your mental states, your emotional states, but also your um, involvement in 
a social world, a community, uh, and seeks a way to enable human beings to flourish, mm. um, to flourish fully, which is how I would understand the classical doctrine of the, the Eightfold Path, a way of life that in incorporates all the aspects of what it means to be human. So in some senses, it's deeply humanistic. Um, it's agnostic in terms of big, big beliefs. It has no room for God. And it's practical. It's something you can do, which is far more important than uh, what it is that you believe. Yes. I, in, in, that's why, as a humanist, it, it hit to something that I was noticing. In human, that I had been the president of uh, some local humanist organizations and been involved with AHA. And, mm -hmm. uh, but the humanist manifestos were intentionally uh, general and simplistic in order to get a broad consensus and agreement. And so what you're left with there is a one-sheet piece of paper compared to, say, the Pali Canon. <laughs> uh, you know, and so it's not really, it doesn't provide you enough to really pursue a, a process of flourishing in life. And that's what led me to philosophy and also ancient Greek philosophy is mm -hmm. part of my practice. Good. Yeah, well, I mean, my involvement with humanism, when I, ha I, 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 I've had, I haven't had a great deal of contact, but I have once or twice been invited to address humanist uh, groups. Um, and I can't say I've been terribly uh, engaged uh, with their perspective. It does seem to be, uh, in a sense, Christian ethics, with all of the Christianity and the religion more or less thrown out. Um, and also a fairly... Um, I would say somewhat dogmatic approach. I mean, they certain they're not really willing to entertain any ideas that could uh, potentially be construed as religious and, and or theistic or whatever. Um, and again, it lays too much emphasis, as you rightly say, on the primacy of, of belief uh, as opposed to the prime the primacy of practice. Yeah, I, I would say that my experience with the humanist community, and and I'm a, a certified humanist minister, uh, but it has been diverse. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would say there's a, a big segment of humanists that are drawn to what we're doing at the Spiritual Naturalist Society. And then there's another segment that they have nothing to do with that. that there's no interest in it. So uh, it's, it's been really interesting. I, I really look forward to what's evolving in the future. Mm -hmm. And um, so your books have covered, obviously, a lot of the kinds of things we've been talking about. And your most recent book, can you tell us something about that? Yeah, my, my most recent book is called uh, After Buddhism, and it, uh, it's the first time I've published with an academic press, so it's somewhat more scholarly in many ways than what I've written before. Um, I deliberately wanted uh, to work with uh, an academic publisher uh, in order that I could go into more detail in some of my arguments for the sort of Buddhism that I'm envisioning. In other words, to you know, look in quite some detail at early uh, Buddhist ideas, uh, look critically at some passages from the Pali texts, and so forth and so on. And in many ways, I think of after Buddhism is, as, as it were, a kind of a, a synopsis um, of what I've been writing over the last uh, three or four decades, mm. um, I try to pull together different threads that I've explored in different other books uh, and try to bring everything together in what I hope at least is a comprehensive um, and integrated whole. And we might loosely call this secular Buddhism or secular Dharma. Um, and I hope this book, uh, After Buddhism, will serve as a kind of a source book or a sort of a, a textbook. Uh, where we might start to then think out the implications of such a secular approach um, in a way that uh, would then perhaps speak to a, 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 a much wider audience. This is not a book published for the general public, uh, although I think it's not particularly difficult to, to read, but it does imply a certain familiarity with Buddhist uh, uh, tradition and classical Buddhist ideas. Um, I'm very happy with it. Uh, it took me quite some time to uh, to write this thing, uh, not the actual book itself, but getting myself in a position in my life where I felt that I could, in fact, uh, try to uh, sketch uh, a bigger picture. And um, although the title, After Buddhism, uh, slightly tongue-in-cheek, it does actually point to the question of, well, what 
you know, if we reject some of the more uh, Indian cosmological beliefs, the supernaturalistic elements of Buddhism, what's that going to look like uh, once you've pared that material away? Uh, what's left? And is it adequate, is it sufficient to construct a, a coherent uh, life philosophy, a coherent uh, practice, an ethic, um, without somehow uh, compromising the integrity of what the Buddha himself presented? Uh, of course, I don't think it does compromise that. Mm -hmm. I would argue it actually uh, uh, helps Buddhism rediscover something of its own heart, frankly. I think Buddhism has got overlaid with all manner of uh, cultural and... Uh, other uh, overlayers that um, really we don't think, I don't think they really speak to people today, you know, reincarnation and devotion to you know, lamas and so on. Um, you know, that served its purpose in earlier societies, but in the 21st century, uh, I think we really need something that uh, can start uh, afresh to consider what the Dharma is and how that may uh, be a way of, uh, of bringing our lives into a greater understanding, a greater sense of concern and compassion for the suffering of others in the world, um, and to start articulating a new kind of spirituality, basically. And I think this is going on in other traditions, too. Um, it, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a long-term process of how those of us who are you know, deeply concerned with primary human values, how do we embody that in a world that is so embedded in an understanding drawn from the, nat nat the natural sciences? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, where do we go from here? I think we're in very uncharted territory, to be quite frank. Yeah, I mean, that's part of what makes it really exciting for me, um, is, is the uncharted territory of it. And, and I am seeing... Because at the society we, we include a lot of different traditions and a lot mm -hmm. of different, so I am seeing a uh, a convergence, if you will, a like a, uh, a naturalization and a secularization of happening within a certain end of the spectrum in several different traditions, and it's creating kind of a common ground, and at the same time a refocusing on the important values, like you mm -hmm. said. Um, so, yeah, I see this happening within several different traditions. Um, uh, it's it's really going to be fascinating. As a society, we want to be careful that we're not trying to create some sort of uh, new dogma, but <laughs> instead just uh, basically a, a place where everybody can uh, come together and share ideas. Mm -hmm. this, so. But you have, uh, as I mentioned in your introduction, uh, uh, you've received uh, both praise and condemnation for this. Country. That's right. Yeah. Um, where have been the uh, exciting places or unexpected places of uh, praise from the traditional Buddhist community? Well, praise from the traditional Buddhist community is not necessarily so forthcoming, but um, it's come from a lot of people who followed a similar path to my own. They've got drawn into Buddhism and uh, at a certain point find that they basically, uh, once they get over the honeymoon period, mm -hmm. uh, they find that they're basically in another church. I mean, it looks a bit different. Uh, it's uh, Asian, it's foreign, it's exo exotic and so on, but they stump, they hit up against exactly the same problems that often led them to leave the Christian or Jewish or other communities in the past. They find that there are certain immutable beliefs that if they don't accept them, there's not, they're not really welcome anymore, and so on and so forth. They find structures of power that are held almost exclusively by ordained priests, again, something they're not particularly interested in. So these people, nonetheless, do feel intuitively a, a, a resonance with the core teachers of the Dharma. And so when they sort of are on, on, on the rebound, as it were, from their not entirely satisfactory involvement with Buddhist religion, um, they find my work and they find that here is a way of looking at this same tradition in a way that does not require those sorts of beliefs, that does not require that one uh, surrender one's autonomy to a church or a priesthood or anything like that. So that's where the praise comes from, uh, mm. I, I, I would say largely. And also people from a more secular uh, perspective who are looking for some kind of some kind of rigorous practice and philosophy that 
addresses uh, you know, what traditionally was the preserve of religion, you know, the great question of life, what does it mean to, or to live fully, what does it mean to, to, to die, and so forth. And so, forth. And so those sorts of people too find that my work is particularly helpful, but the people who don't like it are rather predictably the more traditional Buddhists who feel that, as they often say, that I'm throwing the baby out of the bath with, with the bathwater. I, I reject too much. Uh, it, it's okay to maybe get rid of certain uh, Tibetan or Japanese forms of ritual, but it's going way too far to question certain doctrines, particularly reincarnation, mm. the law of karma and all of these things. That, for them, is a step way too far. Um, so it's interesting. I find myself somehow in the middle of these two uh, camps, as it were. That's it's great. What would you think about... Um, the, con the conception or the model of thinking about this in terms of, of secular Buddhism being uh, just another layer of, of the Dharma. So as it spreads, you've got Southern Buddhism and Northern Buddhism, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, Mahayana, Theravada, and that secular Buddhism is just Western B Buddhism, the next stage as it moves yeah. into another well, that, part of the world. That that is basically how I see it. And uh, again, I've spent a lot of time looking at Buddhism uh, as an historian, trying to understand you know, how is it, it has evolved all these different forms over the last couple of thousand years. And in, in contrast to uh, certain forms of Christianity or certainly Islam, there is no global central authority in Buddhism. There's no pope. There's no, uh, there's no Mecca uh, or anything like that, or no Quran or Bible. So it's a very, it's a much more fluid uh, tradition. It's made up of very different canons of texts and so on. Mm -hmm. And yet, and it has assumed all kinds of very, very different forms. What you see in Tibet is really quite different from what you'll find in Sri Lanka, for example. So it struck me from the beginning that Buddhism doesn't survive by preserving something unchanged. It survives by somehow having the ability to reinvent itself. And what it's doing now I think in its confrontation with modernity, and I would stress modernity rather than the West in a way. I think the East-West di division is again something we're leaving behind now in a more global society. Um, and I find that, you know, my work is, is, for example, it's translated into Korean, it's translated into Japanese, it's uh, in Thai, and so it's not, and it's the pu pu published in India now also, uh, independently of the uh, US and the uh, English-speaking uh, presses. So it, we're really talking of modernity. We're talking about our global uh, contemporary world um, that is, uh, as I've already mentioned, very much informed by the natural sciences. It's uh, politically moving more towards a liberal sort of democratic approach to how we lead our lives. And, and this, I think, is uh, you know, what Buddhism would be expected to do if you could look at it from a Martian's point of view. It would <laughs> enter into some sort of conversation or dialogue with this new uh, way of looking at the world. And uh, in doing so, it would be transformed. Uh, it's not as though Buddhism has this uh, great gift it has to give to the world, and the world has to sort of sit down and just accept it. But this conversation and dialogue will also have a very uh, powerful effect on, on, on Buddhists' own self-understanding. Uh, that the Dharma will be changed, uh, the uh, teachings will be modified, the practices will grow. And uh, we see this particularly uh, in the recent uh, interest in the practice of mindfulness, uh, which is suddenly all over the place, which I would have found you know, 20, 30 years ago when I was doing these kinds of meditations, you know, quite inconceivable that you know, in the 21st century you can get mindfulness meditation from your doctor. Uh, and, and yet that's actually come about. And the governments in, in, in Europe and uh, elsewhere are seriously seeing what, how my mindfulness might become used in, in, in education or in healthcare or, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so this is, I think, the process that uh, mm. in some ways is new. In other ways, is actually just what Buddhism has tended to do in the course of its history, to engage the new culture, the new historical situation, and to try to um, then generate new forms and languages that um, can uh, speak to that condition. So, yes, yeah, nothing new, really, but um, 
you know, it's a long-term process. This is not going to play itself out in the next couple of years by any means. It's True. chances are we're in, in. We have to think of this in terms of the long haul. Um, but um, yeah, I would agree with you. It's uh, we're just moving into another into another modality. Really. Well, I really thank you for your time. We're uh, of course out of time, and uh, these things are always uh, too short for me. But uh, they tell me that. The internet has a short attention span, so <laughs> our, our time. Uh, but uh, I really have uh, enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I'm uh, sure you have too, Lee. Um, very much, very yeah, much. And I, you know, um, thank you so much for being a part of all this and for joining us today. Uh, we're going to um, have your book in our Amazon shop, the Society's Amazon shop, and we're going to announce it and everything. And, and uh, Make sure everybody has all the links. So, um, what's next? What are you? Uh, what are you focused on uh, in the coming days? The coming days. Well, I spend a lot of time tra traveling and teaching. I've just come yesterday. I came back from Germany. I've been teaching courses in Germany. Uh, I go to Poland next week, and at the moment, I'm working on the libretto of a Buddhist opera. Oh wow! Okay. Wow. Well, great. Um, and so uh, we'll also put a link to your website and everything in our description. So I hope people check that out. And uh, thank you, the listener, for joining us and for listening. And uh, feel free to check out spiritualnaturalistsociety.org for other episodes. And until next time, y'all take care. This program was sponsored by the Spiritual Naturalist Society. Learn more and join our community at spiritualnaturalistsociety.org. Our music was composed by John Clemens Rude. J.N. Forrest is our technical director, and Daniel Strain is program director. Our hosts are Daniel, J., and B.T. Newberg. Please share our program with others and join us next time on Spiritual Naturalism Today. Spiritual Naturalism Today.